Good evening and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, Justice Denied, A Personal Perspective with Margaret Yamamoto. My name is Deborah Hoffman and I organize programs and events for the library. Thanks for tuning in. Before we start, I wanna let you know how the evening will go. Our speaker will do a 45 minute presentation and then she'll field questions. To ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. Margaret Yamamoto is a member of the family featured in this presentation and she was incarcerated at the age of two months. She retired after more than 40 years in the marketing and communications fields. Today, she is co-president of the New England chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, a national human rights and educational organization. She has served on the boards of the Japan Society of Boston and the Cambridge Center for Adult Ed. She has also served on advisory committees for the PBS Adult Learning Service, the Greater Boston Food Bank, and the Institute for Asian American Studies at UMass Boston. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Margie. Thank you, Deborah. I've really been looking forward to tonight's talk. Uh, in the time before COVID, I used to give these talks in person and I really enjoyed the opportunity to interact with my audience. At first, I wasn't too happy about giving virtual talks, but now I appreciate the fact that it gives me access to a much wider audience. For example, Tonight, I was able to alert family and friends on the West Coast, and I think many of them are joining us. So welcome to everybody from California, Oregon, and Massachusetts. When I first moved to Massachusetts almost 40 years ago, I found that people knew little about what happened to the Japanese Americans during World War II. In many cases, I was the first person of Japanese ancestry that they'd even ever met. But today, thanks to the internet, movies, television, and books, the story of our experience is being told. It's been nearly 80 years since the start of World War II, but our story is still an important one. It needs to be told to remind us of the fragile nature of the constitutional rights guaranteed all of us as American citizens, and what happened to us could happen to anyone. If you speak to any Japanese American today, you'll find that each has a unique and compelling story, and my family's story is just one of them. Now let's get started. Now I have to go into the technical part of this, and let me see. As we begin, I wanna thank a few people who contributed to my presentation. Many of the photos you'll see are from my own family album, but others have been provided by Art Mills of Oregon, who visited all 10 of the incarceration sites and shared his photos. The US National Archives have opened up their files and made many of their official photos available. And special thanks to my husband, Mark Hopkins, for, the artistic, for his artistic computer skills in helping me put this presentation together. I'd like to begin by introducing you to a few words in Japanese that I'll be using. In Japanese, we have words that describe the generations. They're used the same way we use terms like baby boomers or millennials. The first word is issei. That means first generation in America. This is the immigrant generation that was born in Japan. Next is Nisei, the second generation. They are the children of the Issei and were born in America and are American citizens. There are more generations after that, Sansei, Yonsei, Gosei, meaning third, fourth, and fifth generations. These words are based on the Japanese system of counting, ichi, ni, san, and so forth. So they're words to describe the generations no matter how far back your family goes. For today, we'll be talking about the issei and nisei generations. 
When my family was incarcerated during World War II, I was just an infant, and I really don't remember any of it, but I've learned a great deal about it through family stories told mostly by my mother. We'll be seeing much of this story through her eyes. Let's start by meeting her. This is Kinuko. Her name in Japanese means child of silk. Here she is at the age of 11. She was born in Hilo, Hawaii in 1904. She was a Nisei. This is her family. Only an older brother is missing from the picture. Her younger brother, Yuk, is standing between their parents. You'll notice the two kids aren't smiling for the picture. That's because they've just had an argument. You see, they shared one pair of shoes and guess who got to wear them for the picture? Her parents came to Hawaii in 1897 from a small village in Japan near Hiroshima. They came over as contract laborers for one of the sugarcane plantations in Hawaii. They saved their money and as soon as it was possible, they started their own business, a bakery, one that catered to the plantation workers. It was a family run business, so all the kids were expected to help, Kinuko included. She was just 13 when her father died suddenly. And although she had two brothers, one of them older, it was she who was expected to quit school and work in the family bakery. That was her life until she turned 18. That's her with friends, the second from the left. Back in those days, 18 was the age of marriage and someone had already approached her mother with a proposal for Kinuko. Her response was a loud and emphatic no. She told her mother she wanted to go back to school and learn something other than baking. She wanted to travel on big ships and see the world. Her mother laughed because at the time it was an outrageous wish for a mere girl. But Kinuko persisted and her mother agreed to send her to sewing school where she learned all the needle arts. By the time her brothers were helping in the bakery and she was able to go out on outings with her friends. That's her in the white hat sitting on the car's running board in the middle of a sugarcane field. Kinuko's mother waited patiently, but in a few years, she again brought up the subject of marriage. But Kinuko insisted she still wanted to travel on a big ship and see the world. Finally, her mother relented and decided to send her to Japan, where she hoped Kinuko would learn the language and some of the more refined aspects of being a proper Japanese woman. That's Kinuko on the left. The year was 1928, a time when things American were popular in Japan. She stayed with relatives in her parents' home village near Hiroshima. Once there, Kinuko found herself in great demand teaching the Western style of sewing to women and English conversation to the young men. She embraced the Japanese lifestyle and began wearing kimonos and perfecting her Japanese. She told me she got a big kick out of being called sensei. Sensei is a title given professionals like teachers, doctors, and priests. And here she was with just an eighth grade education being called sensei by everyone. She even found time to date. Now remember, this is the 1920s. Dating in Japan meant bringing a chaperone. In this case, her teenage cousin shown here in the middle. The three of them would start the date. Then they would deposit their chaperone at the new cinema theater and the couple would disappear until the movie was over. Unfortunately, all too soon, Kinuko's mother decided it was time for her to return home and get serious about finding a husband. So reluctantly, she returned to Hawaii. By now, she was 26 years old, an old maid by the standard of those days. Most of the men she knew in Hilo were too young, too old, or already married. Then an unexpected letter from California arrived that changed everything. Her cousin wrote telling her, I found a husband for you. The young man was Sohei Yamamoto. 
He came to California in 1926 from a small fishing village in Japan. This was during the time of the Asian Exclusion Act that barred all Asians from immigrating to the United States. So Sohei sailed to Mexico, joined a group of migrant Mexican tomato pickers and walked into California. Yes, he was an early illegal alien and he is an Ise. When he met Kinuko's cousin, he was managing a Japanese grocery store in Los Angeles' Little Tokyo. When this cousin offered to be the go-between for the couple, he was interested. The first step was an exchange of photos. He had this one taken to reflect his more serious side and sent it off. Meanwhile, Kinuko was having a difficult time deciding what to send. She had that great picture of her in a kimono, one that would probably delight the heart of any Japanese man. But that was not the message she wanted to send. She was independent and very American. So she settled on this photo, wearing a dress she had designed and sewed and sat standing in the bright Hawaiian sun. The couple exchanged letters and just two months later, Kinuko found herself again sailing on a big ship, this time to California. She arrived on October 17, 1931, stayed with her cousin, and then on November 5th, that's less than three weeks later, they were married. They were able to gather the few friends and relatives they had in Los Angeles for a wedding celebration. Many years later, I asked her how she felt marrying a man she hardly knew. She told me, I didn't want to worry my mother anymore. So I took a deep breath. I closed my eyes and I got married. As they began planning for the future, the year was 1931 and the country was in the middle of the Great Depression. Jobs were scarce and money very, very tight. They heard about a place called Terminal Island where there was work and opportunities for Japanese people. In 1931, as you can see in this aerial photo, Southern California looked very different. Here's Los Angeles. Directly to the south, you'll find Terminal Island. It's an, excuse me, it's an actual island that's about one to two miles wide and nearly four miles long. It's located between San Pedro and Long Beach. Back then, there were no bridges to the island, only a ferry from San Pedro. The population on the island was primarily Japanese and Japanese Americans who lived and worked there. The men of Terminal Island were fishermen. They fished for the tuna and mackerel that was so plentiful off the California coast. Their wives worked in the canneries, processing the fish they caught. In the days before large scale refrigeration, the canneries operated on an as needed basis 24 seven. When a fishing boat came in with its catch, they sounded a horn that could be heard across the island and the women came immediately to begin processing the fish. It didn't matter if it was two or three in the morning. It wasn't a surprise that the canneries provided housing for their workers and their families, making Terminal Island truly a company town. At its height, Terminal Island had more than 3,000 residents. Kinuko and Sohei opened a grocery store on the island to serve the many families who lived and worked there. Sohei spoke little English, so from day one, Kinuko worked by his side, ordering supplies and handling everything that required English. When I asked her about their hours, she just laughed and she said, we worked all the time. Soon they welcomed their first child, my sister, Shinko Shirley, born in 1933. They added two boys, my brothers, Hajime James and Tadashi Teddy. The family quickly became part of the unique Terminal Island community. The island had restaurants, hotels, bars, stores, schools, doctors, everything needed to build a self-sufficient little town. In those early years, Sohei enjoyed taking my sister to community picnics. 
Many families also celebrated traditional Japanese holidays like New Year's Day, Boys' Day, and as you can see in this picture, Girls' Day. That's my sister on the left being held up by invisible hands. Both Kinuko and Sohei worked long hours in the store and the boys were left in the care of their sister. Because it was such a closed community, it was safe for them to play almost anywhere. And there was usually an adult nearby. The family and the grocery store thrived. Sohei was able to expand his business to include ship chandlery, a ship chandlery serving Japanese freighters and passenger ships. But then everything changed when on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States declared war on Japan. Terminal Island's location played an important role in what happened next. Let's take another look at a map. Here's Terminal Island. Los Angeles is directly to the north. An army installation at Fort MacArthur was located in San Pedro to the west and in 1941, a major naval station was being established in nearby Long Beach to the east. And poor Terminal Island was right in the middle. Within hours of the Pearl Harbor attack, the FBI descended on Terminal Island and began picking up community and religious leaders and many of the men who owned commercial fishing boats. Terminal Island's locations location and the men's access to boats made them suspected of helping the enemy. We were fortunate that my father was not among those arrested because he had a ship chandlery and sold supplies to the Japanese before the war. He had already been thoroughly investigated by the FBI and they didn't feel he posed a threat. The other Issei and Nisei men on Terminal Island were not as lucky. Once they were taken, their families didn't see them again for months, and in some cases for years. Not a single one of these men was ever found to have committed an act of sabotage against the United States. Every home was searched by the FBI for contraband, and it was confiscated. That included things like cameras, flashlights, kitchen knives, even Boy Scout knives. There were stories of the FBI pouring out the family's soy sauce because it looked like liquid dynamite and shredding sanitary napkins looking for secret messages. As America entered the war, the national press quickly began carrying stories and photos to inflame anti-Japanese sentiments. Unfortunately, these negative sentiments often spilled over onto the Issei and Nisei the first and second generation Japanese, with headlines like, FBI detains Japs considered risks as enemy agents. Even the beloved Dr. Seuss became involved with editorial cartoons like this, showing Japanese on the West Coast lining up to be issued dynamite with which to commit acts of sabotage. On December 22, 1941, just two weeks after Pearl Harbor, Time magazine used an image of the Japanese admiral who led the attack on the Pearl Harbor. This is his photo. And this is the caricature they used on the cover. Inside was an article telling you the difference between the Chinese and Japanese using information based on obviously racist stereotypes. I've lived now, I've lived among Asian Americans most of my life, and my friends and I still have difficulty telling the difference between different Asian groups. But Life magazine felt it was the expert and published stories with detailed descriptions. The faces they used in the article were of a Chinese public servant in the top photo and of General Tojo, the Prime Minister of Japan, on the bottom. There was a diagram of both faces, and the Chinese were described as being relatively tall and slender, with parchment yellow skin and a long and delicately boned face. The Japanese, on the other hand, were squat, had a massively boned head and face, flat nose, and yellow ochre skin. In a second set of pictures, we have a full body view of three tall, young, slender, Chinese brothers, and I quote, 
two short squat Japanese admirals. Despite these misleading stereotypes from Life magazine, the public still could not tell the difference between the Japanese and other Asians, and their fear, anger, and hatred were being directed at anyone who looked Asian. To protect themselves, some Chinese used homemade signs like this or wore armbands and buttons stating, I am Chinese. The Japanese countered with buttons and store signs like this one stating, I am an American. By February 2nd, 1942, every remaining adult Japanese man on Terminal Island where we lived was taken into custody by the FBI. On February 19th, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 that gave the military total jurisdiction over the Western military zone. He signed it over the objections of Attorney General Francis Biddle and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, both of whom felt the order was unconstitutional and unnecessary. Here's an excerpt from that presidential order. It's stated, I hereby authorize and direct the Secretary of War and his military commanders who he may designate to prescribe military areas from which persons may be excluded. And the right of any person to enter, remain in, or leave shall be subject to whatever restrictions the Secretary of War or the appropriate military commander may impose at his discretion. You notice they did not specify the Japanese as a target of this presidential order. This order was not rescinded until 1976 by President Gerald Ford. That means for 34 years, it was still on the books and could have been enforced at any time against any political, ethnic, or religious group. With the presidential order putting the military in complete control of the Western zone, Terminal Island became the first area in the United States to be affected. Just six days after executive order was signed, on February 25th, 1942, the more than 3,000 residents of Terminal Island were ordered to leave their homes and businesses and evacuate the island in just 48 hours. At that point, with few exceptions, the only people left on the island were women, teenagers, and children. Most of the men had already been arrested by the FBI. Despite the requirement of the presidential order that transportation, food, shelter, and accommodations be provided those removed from an area, no such provisions were made for their relocations. The only help came from family, friends, and churches. The fishermen's wives tried to sell their husbands fishing boats. Eventually they had to abandon them and they had to abandon their houses. A member of the American Friends Service Committee who helped the Terminal Island families wrote, as night of the second day of the evacuation of Terminal Island drew on and the deadline drew ever nearer, little groups still toiled feverishly in an effort to load and move the last remnants of all the disrupted homes within the allotted time. The empty houses were dark as the electric current had been cut off. Unable to carry flashlights, which were contraband, the Japanese finished their tasks in the gleam of flashlights held steadily for hours on end in the hands of Caucasian friends who flocked to their aid. In our family, we were fortunate that my mother wasn't taken, that my father wasn't taken by the FBI because my mother was eight and a half months pregnant. With me, by the way, and they had three children under the age of nine. My parents' friends and relatives came with trucks and cars and helped to empty the store of what could not be sold. We moved to an apartment in Los Angeles. After we left, Terminal Island became a ghost town. And just 12 days after that forced evacuation on March 11th, 1942, I was born. I was the first baby in my family born in a hospital the others were delivered at home by a midwife. I was named Masumi Margaret after my grandmother and the child actress, Margaret O'Brien. 
all the Japanese on the West Coast were watching what happened to us on Terminal Island because they knew they were next. About one month after we were forced to leave our home, the first of a series of mass evacuation orders was issued to the rest of the West Coast Japanese population. The poster on the right gave specific instructions to the Japanese. The plan was to move all persons of Japanese ancestry out of the Western military zone as soon as possible. This involved up to 120,000 people. On this map, you can see where the military established that zone along the Western states from Arizona all the way up the coast to Washington. Because it was impossible to build the more permanent camps quickly, the Japanese were first taken to 15 temporary detention centers, mostly in California, where they were confined at racetracks and state fairgrounds. In two and a half months, all 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry were removed from their homes in the Western military zone and placed in these temporary detention centers. They were taken from their homes and instructed to bring only what they could carry with them. Two thirds of them were American citizens. They were taken from orphanages and hospitals. They were taken if they were found to have even one sixteenth Japanese blood. They were taken regardless of age from the oldest to the very youngest. My family was sent to the Turlock Detention Center in Central California. This is the intake area where our bags are being searched. We are housed in hastily erected barracks like the one in the background. Some were not as lucky and were sent to racetracks like Santa Anita and were housed in horse stalls that were barely cleaned and whitewashed and still reeked of manure. We were held at these temporary detention centers for several months while the permanent camps were being built. These permanent incarceration camps, euphemistically called relocation centers, were scattered across the states. There were 10 camps located in California, Arizona, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, and as far east as Arkansas. The irony of this was there were Japanese already living in some of these states and they were not imprisoned. From the temporary center in central California, we were taken by train to a permanent camp in Arizona. It was July and the train was not air conditioned. The shades were pulled down so no one could see us and my poor mother had to contend with three restless children and me, a four month old still in diapers. We arrived at Gila River, Arizona on July 28th, 1942. The camp was located 50 miles southeast of Phoenix and 87 miles northwest of Tucson in the middle of nowhere. The government leased 17,000 acres of Pima Indian Reservation land and built the camp on 1,000 acres. At its peak occupancy, Gila River housed 13,348 people, making it the fourth largest city in the state of Arizona. The camp was surrounded by barbed wire fencing with a strategically placed armed guard tower. We were told this would be our home for the duration. The area is often considered the hottest in the United States with temperatures as high as 115 degrees. Families were housed in black tar paper covered barracks. A barrack was 20 feet wide by 100 feet long. For larger families like ours, it was divided into four living units. So our family of six lived in a space 20 by 25 feet in size. What everyone remembers were the ever present sandstorms as you can see in this sketch by Nisei artist Mine Okubo. These hastily constructed barracks were made with green lumber that shrank in the hot Arizona sun. The sand invaded the barracks through gaps between the lumber, and my mother had to put layers of wet cheesecloth over my crib to protect me. The units were empty except for army carts, cots. We were given empty mattress pads to fill with straw for our beds. 
Here's a typical unit. Any furniture you see was made with scrap lumber. The partition between each family's living space was open at the top, which meant absolutely no privacy for anyone. That lack of privacy even extended to the showers and the toilets. These facilities were built military style with separate latrines and showers for men and women. In the showers, the more modest women would wear bathing suits. Here's another sketch by Mine Okubo showing the partitions that were eventually built between the toilets in the woman's area, but only after the churches intervened. They did not allow any doors, so the women had to improvise their own. There were so many people that there were lines for everything, from mess hall lines to lines for the latrine and showers or to do your laundry. You might stand in some lines for hours. Because the Japanese Americans had a wide range of professions, some were offered jobs in the camps. No one was allowed to earn any more than the average GI, so doctors, teachers, and other professionals earned $19 a month. $16 a month was paid for skilled labor like the camp cooks, and $12 a month for unskilled labor like mess hall helpers. Getting fresh vegetables was not a problem at Gila River, where we had a successful agricultural operation. We, we reactivated the irrigation canals that had been developed by the indigenous Indians many centuries earlier and turned the area into rich farmland. We grew more than 40 Western and Asian vegetable crops and supplied all of the camp's vegetable needs. By 1943, life at Gila River was falling into a routine. It was considered a model camp, so it was often visited by outside government officials. Perhaps the most prominent among them was the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. As the model camp, Gila River was the only one she visited. Prior to her visit, all of the drab tar paper covered barracks were painted bright white and she was greeted with welcoming smiles. Mrs. Roosevelt was opposed to the incarceration of the Japanese, and she made her feelings clear in newspaper columns and in an article that appeared in Collier's Magazine shortly after her Gila River visit. She wrote in part, a Japanese American may be no more Japanese than a German American is German, or an Italian American is Italian. We have no common race in this country, but we have an ideal to which all of us are loyal. We cannot progress if we look down upon any group of people amongst us because of race or religion. We retain the right to lead our individual lives as we please, but we can only do so if we grant to others freedoms that we wish for ourselves. A very wise lady. It wasn't until February of 1943 that the authorities finally decided to ask about the loyalty of the people they had imprisoned. All persons 17 years of age and older were asked to complete the loyalty questionnaire. It was consisting of 28 questions. The last two caused confusion and anger in the camps. Question 27 asked, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States in combat duty wherever ordered? Those of draft age wondered if a yes automatically meant they were enlisting. There were many willing to fight, but others demanded that their families be freed from the camps before they would volunteer and they would refuse the draft. Women and the elderly Issei who could not fight wondered what would happen to them if they answered no. The younger Issei, who still had family in Japan, wondered if they might find themselves having to fight against brothers or cousins. Question 28 asked, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and forswear any form of allegiance to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government power or organization? For the Issei, who were barred from American citizenship by U.S. law, if they answered yes, they would become people without a country. 
The Nisei felt insulted they would be asked to forswear allegiance to an emperor in a country they never even visited. At the same time, the Nisei feared if, if they answered yes, yes to the two questions and their parents no, no, the family would be separated. They were right. Those families and individuals who answered no, no were considered troublemakers and sent to a segregated camp on the California-Oregon border. There, they were given harsher treatment. Some who refused military service were sent to prison. The loyalty questionnaire came as the government began efforts to form a segregated all Nisei military combat team. Originally, all Nisei were classified as 4C or enemy aliens and non-draftable, even though they were all American citizens. Eventually, the military reversed this stand and began actively recruiting the Nisei. Some were assigned to the Pacific Theater with the military intelligence service as translators, and they interrogated captured Japanese prisoners of war. Others were sent to Europe as members of the legendary 442nd Regimental Combat Team, where their incredible bravery was honored with 21 medals of honor, the highest military honor possible. The men of the 4042nd received more than 18,000 individual decorations, more than half of which were Purple Hearts that are awarded those wounded or killed in action. By the war's end, the all Nisei 442nd Regimental Combat Team became the most highly decorated combat unit of its size in US military history, and is shown here being honored by President Harry Truman. While these Nisei were fighting in Europe and the Pacific, many of their families were still being held behind barbed wire in their own country. Back at Gila River, the loyalty questionnaire was administered to my parents. Ever the pragmatists, they answered yes, yes, anything that might give us an opportunity to leave the camp. By 1944, the government began to allow families and individuals to leave if they stayed outside the Western military zone and had a job and a place to live. My uncle lived in Denver, had his own business, and agreed to be our sponsor. This picture was taken just before we left Gila River on April 21st, 1944. And it's the only picture I have of me as a baby. Since our cameras were confiscated right after the war broke out, we have very few pictures from this period. When we left the camp, we were given a one-way bus ticket to Denver and $25 a person. Our trip to Denver resulted in our exposure to what some Japanese Americans were already experiencing outside the camps. We weren't greeted with signs like this, but it was an indication of what we might expect. For the trip to Denver, my mother and three of the kids used the bus ticket. My father and eight-year-old brother drove with our uncle and all our baggage from Gila River to Denver. On the way, they stopped in a small town diner for lunch. Before they were finished eating, they suddenly realized word had gotten out about their presence and a crowd was forming at the entrance of the diner. They had to be escorted out the back door for their safety. When we all arrived in Denver, we felt relatively safe being among family. But one day I went to the post office with my mother. I had to be about one or three at the, I mean, I'm sorry, two or three at the time. We were waiting in line to buy stamps when suddenly a woman saw us and began pointing and chanting over and over, two for penny japs. We left quickly without our stamps. Soon after my parents decided to leave Denver and we were on the road again, this time to Chicago where the government was encouraging many Japanese from the camps to settle. We opened a restaurant in what was to become the Japanese section of town and called it the Gila River Inn so anyone coming out of the camp could find us. The war ended in 1945 
And in the next year, we left Chicago, made a quick stop in Denver and moved back to Southern California. Dad joined his brother who had moved his business from Denver and mom went to work in a sewing factory. By this time, dad was in his mid forties, but ever the entrepreneur, he and mom saved their money and soon opened another grocery store, Aloha Market in Gardena, California. You can guess who named the store. When Japanese ships began to trade in the port of Los Angeles again, dad restarted his ship chandlery and moved the store to San Pedro. This time they called the business Yamamoto Brothers, hoping their two sons would eventually take it over. As the business grew, they moved to a warehouse in Wilmington, just across the water from Terminal Island. Eventually it looked like this and was operated by my oldest brother, Jimmy, until his retirement in 2012. My other brother, Teddy, went on to become a lawyer. My sister, Shirley, was widowed early and worked with Jimmy in the family business. As the business grew, mom and dad were able to travel. And in 1972, they went back to the small village in Japan where dad was born. It was the first time he'd been back since 1926. In all those years after the war, my parents never spoke ill of their camp experience. When dad was 75, I gave him a Japanese translation of America's concentration camps. Now it's not the best book about our experience, but it was the only one I could find that was translated into Japanese. This was the first time he had seen anything like this in print in a language he could read easily. He had spent more than 33 years feeling the guilt and shame of our imprisonment and never saw anything that told him what happened to him was unjust. After he read the book, he asked me to please get him more books in Japanese like that one. He was ill with cancer at the time and passed away the next year and I was never able to find him more books. 12 years after dad's death, the United States government passed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, granting reparations to Japanese who had been incarcerated during World War II. Watching President Reagan sign the act are Norman Mineta and Bob Matsui. Both are Japanese American men who had been incarcerated as children and were, went on to become US congressmen. The hard work to get this act passed took more than 18 years and was led by the Nisei and Sansei, that's the second and third generations of Japanese Americans. They enlisted the support of like-minded senators and representatives to pass this legislation that resulted in payment of $20,000 to each person who had been incarcerated and was still alive. When the check, with the check, came an official letter of apology from the sitting presidents. This is a letter I received. It's signed by the senior George Bush. The government began by paying the oldest Japanese first because so many of the Issei and Nisei were dying. I was visiting my mother a few months after she was paid and I asked her what she did with the money. Now in my mother's house, she had a Buddhist altar in the living room where she put pictures of deceased relatives. Whenever we had a family celebration or dinner, she always put some, some of the food there so they could share in the festivities. She took me to the altar and there, resting against dad's picture was her uncashed check. She just wanted to be sure he knew. On her 88th birthday, our whole family gathered to celebrate, including her younger brother, Yuke, who was 86 and flew over from Hawaii to join us. As you can see, this time, they both got to wear their own shoes. Her four kids were on hand too. That's Jimmy on the left, the oldest brother who took over the family business. Teddy, the lawyer, is next to him. That's me when my hair was still all black and finally, my sister, Shirley. My mother died the year after this picture was taken. She was 89. Although my parents are no longer with us, 
The story continues. For you see, when a strong-willed young woman who wanted to see the world meets an adventurous entrepreneurial young man, together they can overcome many obstacles. We're fortunate that they've left us with these stories. They've also left us with a large, multiracial, multicultural family that includes four children, 13 grandchildren, 21 great-grandchildren, and eight great-great-grandchildren. Our story is one of the many thousands to result from our World War II incarceration. What happened to us is almost 80 years in the past, but the lessons we all need to learn about fear, racism, and hate are as fresh as today's headlines. I'd like to close with the words of the late Congressman John Lewis. When he talked about building a movement for change, he challenged us and made us look to the future. John Lewis said, ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or one year. Ours is not the struggle of one judicial appointment or presidential term. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime, or maybe even many lifetimes, and each one of us in every generation must do our part. Thank you. And Deb, back to you. I'll close this out. Deborah, it's all yours. Oh, thank you so much, Margie, for that wonderful presentation and for sharing with us uh, that story of your family. It was, it was beautiful and so informative. Um, and it's astonishing to hear about what families uh, were forced to go through um, during that time. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, we have uh, several questions for you oh, from the oh, audience. Oh, um, also, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you will. Um, also, several hellos. I'll just read those quickly. Um, a personal note, uh, hello from your longtime GBH colleague, um, Cynthia Alper Alperowitz. Broner. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, sending good wishes to you. Oh, um, hi. Let's see, uh, looks like Ola Perry Onapidi. Margie, yep. I have not heard this narrative and I'm loving it. Oh, she's um, a dear old friend. Yes, um, Alexa Shab Shabakov. 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 Yeah. Um, so a couple of um, other comments. Um, let's see. But I want to get to the questions. Um, what a story. Was the US divided about this at the time? And were organizations working to get people freed or was it just accepted? Um, generally, first of all, you know, we were attacked on our own land by a foreign country. And so everybody was, was looking upon Japan as the emperor and no one was caring whether we were American citizens or not. But um, yes, the churches, especially the, um, the friends, the, um, the Quakers were very much uh, helpful to us through it all. And some of the colleges, not all of the colleges, but some of the colleges helped to get some of the, um, the students who were pulled out of college, taken out of the camps and put into Midwestern colleges. Um, here's the interesting thing. Uh, you would think that the um, ACLU would be right on the case of this. The only ACLU that spoke up against incarceration of the Japanese was the Northern California ACLU. None of the others said anything. And um, and there's there's been heroes in our history who of, of lawyers who came and tried to get in, in individual cases um, Japanese Americans out of the camps. And and there were four cases that um, I think they all made it to the um, Supreme Court. I'm not the best person to answer all of the legal questions, but um, 
as I remember correctly, there were four cases that made it to the Supreme Court, and they were turned down, every one of them, as in favor of the incarceration, except for one. And uh, it was a case by Mitsui Endo, a, a woman. And, um, and I'm not too sure about the details of it, but again, I'd have to look it up in order to tell you more details. But uh, no, there wasn't any, it, it wasn't like today where we've got people expressing uh, dissatisfaction about whether it's the election or whether it's about anything. Um, it, it was a different time. And, and that's what we have to remember. It was a really different time. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have television. It was all, radio was the closest you could get to something immediate. And it was all newspapers and written. For example, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, there was suddenly a blackout on news coming out of Pearl Harbor. And I think that was put there by the military. So as a result, the only information people were, were sharing with each other were all hearsay rumors. The rumors like uh, some of the Japanese planes that came down, they were wearing McKinley High School class rings or UCLA class rings, indicating they graduated from American schools and then went back to plan the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, yep, there was just all sorts of, oh, the one I really love is that the Japanese farmers in Hawaii cut arrows into the sugarcane fields pointing to the airfields. That's a good one. I mean, these were the kind of stories that were coming out and none of them substantiated with fact. I mean, it was just things people were saying. Fake news. Good news. Yeah. Fake news. Fake, fake know. news, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, hi, Ms. Yamamoto. This is a very impressive talk. I am sorry for what you and your family and other families like yours experienced during the war years. Have you read either of Julie Otuska's novels that touch on the Japanese internment? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've read them both. They're very nice. <laughs> I, I mean, there, there are more substantial books out there that give you more detail, but her books are very, very poetic, I think, and, uh, and, and they're a quick read. So a lot of people have read it, and, and I'm glad that it's out there. Um, there are other books that I think go into more detail and um, historic fact that I find more educational about what happened. But this is good. I don't mind. Uh, it's sort of like, um, what is it? Well, no, I won't go into books. I, I won't tell you. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, when your parents opened their stores, how did they find the process of renting or leasing space for their respective businesses? Okay, I'm trying to think back to uh, the businesses we'd be talking about. Um, if you mean after, right after the war, when we uh, opened that two, three-sided grocery store on a busy street in Gardena, uh, we were renting from a Japanese family who owned the property. So there was no problem there. Um, and uh, when we rented in San Pedro, again, it was a little area in San Pedro where many of the Japanese were settling down. Um, and, and we had the grocery store and across the street was the Japanese barbershop, you know, little stores there. And so uh, we were always in a Japanese neighborhood, it felt like, so that there was no problem. When we bought our first house, however, after the war, we bought it in Compton, California. And um, I'm sure many of you know Compton as the home of, of, of the um, Williams Sisters of Tennis. And, and uh, back then it was a pretty mixed neighborhood, uh, but I think we were the first, last Asians on the block because uh, we stayed there a long longer time than most others. And, and it was, it, it, you know, eventually became, a, I think all black neighborhood back then, by the time the Williams sisters were there, we were gone. So, okay. but anyway, uh, 
I, you know, I, I don't know what the finances were that my parents were going through during that time or where they got the money, but um, they saved. They had relatives who would help too. And, um, it, you know, it was just, everyone was helping each other though, because it was a tough time. Um, this person says, I admit that my first knowledge of the incarceration camps was reading the novel Snow Falling on Cedars it's in a beautiful the 1990s. Novel. Uh -huh. um, do you make presentations to high school students? Um, I have mixed feelings about doing presentations to high school students, unless they are studying this in school. If I go in there cold, I, I, I've done it. I have done it. Yeah. But if I go in there cold and they haven't been studying history of that period, um, I'm not too happy with the reaction I get because they don't understand what I'm saying. They've got to put it in context of what history was and what was happening. And um, let's just put it from my standpoint and experience uh, of reaction from audiences. If I go in cold to a high school class, kids are back in the back of the classroom, looking at their phones or doing whatever. And it's just, it's not very rewarding to me to go into situations like that. But if they've been studying the topic, uh, they, they're usually very attentive and I enjoy doing it and, and I enjoy interacting with them. But uh, so it depends on the situation. Yes, I have given talks at high schools, but it depends. Got it. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this difficult, enlightening story. Um, great presentation. Um, wonderful talk. Thank you. Bravo, Margie. Um, <laughs> Continued prejudices must be painful to feel. What can you say to those experiencing prejudices now? I'm really surprised that it continues right now with the Asian hate crimes. It, it, it just sort of, you know, I can't imagine, I, I, I thought we were past it, but we're not. And, and that's the scary part. When all of the hate crimes started and all, all of this was happening in the last couple of years, I have to admit, I was kind of afraid to go out in the street because I'm an old person. I mean, I don't look frail, but I am an old person and they've been attacking old people and kicking them to the ground, you know. Um, and I was afraid to go into downtown Boston because I, I thought, well, you know, I'll park the car close to where I'm going and I'll just run in there and come out. But um, it, it's, I, I think like all of us, we're frustrated and we get angry and um, we're not sure what we can do. That's why I give my talks because I wanna remind people of our history and the fact that we can't go back that road again. We are going back on that road again, but there isn't too much. I'll do what I can do, and I'll give my talk as many times as they ask me. <laughs> but um, um, I think it, our only hope is to educate the young people. But then it gets scary when you hear that they're not going to teach certain things in the schools anymore because it's too hurtful. And I'm sorry, you got to teach the truth. <gasps> It's a hard history to, yeah. to learn, but it's really important. It's, it's very important, more so than it was when I was younger even. So uh, yeah, I, I hope I answer. I, mean, I don't even know if I'm answering these questions. You are, you're doing a great job. <laughs> I just keep going really on. Um, let's see. Uh, a couple more questions. Are you okay with staying oh, on a little bit longer? Yeah, I am. I'm not falling asleep yet. Okay. So. <laughs> um, can you talk about Tule Lake? My oh, husband Tule was Lake. born there. Was this a special, more restricted place? 
Oh yes, it was a horrible place. Um, as I said, they they sent the, the no no people, the people who said no to those two questions. They sent them to Tule Lake, and um, and there they made. They, they had more restrictive regulations than they had in any of the other camps. Guards um, and um, people were, well, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not the best spokesperson of things that happened to Tule Lake, but I do know that it was the worst camp to be in. And um, many of the people, not many, but uh, some of the people who lived there when the war was over, they were forced to go back to Japan because at one point they renounced their, see, it's a whole history of, of that camp and how people ended up there. And um, and I, I don't know enough about all the details to give them to you, but um, at one point, many people, not many, but some people got angry about what was done to them with the incarceration during World War II. And um, they would renounce their citizenship and things like that, and they would end up at Tule Lake. And um, many of those people were not allowed to rescind their, 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 rescind what they had done. If they had, you know, decided afterwards that they want to stay in America, some of them were not allowed to do that. And they were sent to Japan. And Japan was horrible right after the war. There was food shortages. People were starving to death. I mean, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, you know, and Nagasaki. I mean, Japan was not a place you wanted to go to. And, and also, when you went there as an American, Japanese American, uh, your families might not even welcome you because they thought you were the, tr you were the enemy. The Americans were the enemy. And uh, they wouldn't even be accepted in their own families. I mean, it was it was horrible to go back there, and um, but many people did, and and they survived, and luckily, and it was rough. It was very hard. So, but Tule Lake was the camp for people they considered to be less loyal, and uh, and it, it was just a horrendous situation for them, and. Um, you know, it, it's and it, what's very interesting is that in the Japanese American community, it's it wasn't we didn't always talk about Tule Lake openly like this. And uh, there's been a lot lot of activism within the community, and all of this information is coming out as a result, and it's and it's important. And and so there's there's a you know, there's there's films about Tule Lake. If you go online, put Tule Lake in film, and and you can probably access some of those films, and it'll go into detail. Like I've only seen parts of some of them, and um, and and it it looked horrible the way that people were being treated. They actually have film of it, and um, it, it it wasn't the place you wanted to be. At any rate. So thank you, thank you yes. for that. So thank you, for whoever it was. Thank you for bringing up Tule Lake. I just wish I was more well versed in its history that I could speak about it more fully. Um, let's see, um, one person is recommending um, the color of success: Asian Americans and the origins of the model minority. Um, it's more of a textbook, so it has more historic details. I guess I haven't read that one. <laughs> okay, well, that Maybe person's recommending it. Yeah. The Color um, of Success, huh? The Color of Success, Asian oh. Americans and the Origins of the Model Minority. Okay. Um, and I think that's it for questions. All right. Is there, um, is there a message that you want to leave the audience with? Well, I kind of put it in at the end of my talk um, because John Lewis said it so eloquently. And, and it's just, find out more about our history. If this is the first time you heard about what happened to the Japanese Americans, there are other examples like this. And, and they're all important to know about because uh, I guess for me, the scary thing is I see history repeating itself too often. And, and this is the only one I can speak to with any knowledge, and I see it repeating itself. And I don't know. 
I'm getting too old to do too much demonstrate demonstrating out there, but uh, maybe I will. <laughs> um, well, you're you're doing a lot just by by speaking publicly. Well, um, so thank I you. thank you again for um, for agreeing to join us tonight. Well, thank and you for the invitation. I really I really appreciate it and enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who tuned in and for asking all those great questions. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Good night.